Welcome to the Big MX Radio Podcast, brought to you by Racetech. Racetech, engines, and suspension, those gold valves, pretty much a revalve in a box. Don't believe me? You can go straight to the website, email those guys. They're super, uh, they're super helpful, as well as you can call them up. And when you mention Big MX Radio, you're going to save some money. I am your host, Brad Gebhardt. With me on the line, a pleasure of mine to ha- bring on this guy. He is a guy who I've looked up to for a l- very long period of time, and he's partially to blame to why I do all these podcasts is his content and all those magazines for so long that got me hooked on this sport and got me to the place I am today where I'm able to cover this, cover the sport of motocross basically full time. His name is Jay Clark. Jay, welcome to the Big MX Radio Podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. It should be fun. It will be fun, man. I, I can't wait to, to dig into things with you. We've already established off air that they were pretty much guaranteed to have to have uh, around two, three, and maybe even four when it comes down to really digging into all the amazing things that you do with Dirt Bike TV. On top of the fact that you've been in the industry since 1990. I was at the tender age of two years old. I was probably still in diapers uh, when you were entering the motocross industry. And uh, But it, it's been an amazing thing for you for, the, for a very long period of time, uh, well over 30 years. Uh, the stories are long. Uh, and I'm, and and many I might add as well, but uh, yeah, where does this whole story start for you? Well, I guess as a kid, I just enjoyed dirt bikes. I really really was hooked. We really didn't have the money to be doing it. So every I'd have a bike, but would only ride a little bit until it broke, and then it would sit for six or nine months or whatever it was till we could could fix it or whatever. So that was a big struggle, I guess, as a kid. Really didn't ride much, and so once I got out of high school, moved out on my own. I was a machinist. So so I had a bit of a technical background through, through high and so forth. And when I moved out to California, I said, I'm getting my own bike. And so that was, I got a 90 uh, YZ250, uh, RM250 RM was one of my first real bikes, you know? And uh, that's, I like those Suzuki's. I still, still enjoy those today. And uh, that was really fun to get where I had my own bike. And then from there, I just got into things and progressed. That's awesome. It all starts with a 1977 RM80. Back in the day, they weren't 85s. They didn't turn, start to be 85s until actually I started racing them back in 2000. Uh, but uh, yeah, my dad was a Suzuki guy back in the day as well. He rode uh, 75 and 78 RM125. So uh, was yours a steel tank or was it pl- plastic by 77? No, steel, steel tank. And my uncles rode Suzuki's. And I had an uncle that was Vince Clark. It was national number 44 in 1977 okay. or so, somewhere in there. He was, yeah, yeah. So, so that was our little bit of claim to fame and, and uh, rode with him off and on when, you know, when I was an adult, I'd ride with him out in California a bit. And so they all rode as kids. And so my uncles are the ones that kind of got me into it a bit, you know, and got me, you know, hooked, so to speak. And then you know, when, I, you know, when I was a kid and had those little bikes, we didn't, uh, I didn't have a dad around, but whenever I could get help from say an uncle or whoever, that's how I'd be fixing bikes. And so that was a struggle, uh, you know, refixing bikes, as you know, it's a big part of it is maintenance and keeping them going. For sure. And, and I, I gotta say, man, you have really helped out a lot of people who, uh, maybe they didn't take care of their bike as, as, uh, as well as they do today. Because frankly, they just didn't know. There's a lot of things like I, I talked to some people who just got into the sport and you go over to their pit and you kind of see like, hey, why is that loose? Or like, hey, do you, have you replaced that recently? And it's not because they're negligent or negligent or they're uh, like they're they're intentionally not changing things out. Like some people just don't know enough to know they don't know. Um, and, and that's something that when, when you, when you watch, uh, whether it be on YouTube or, uh, uh on Instagram, uh, you pack a ton of value into a, 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 a absolute like tip to tail front to back of every machine that you work on. Um, and one of the, one of the things that I find is, is sort of your key to success when it comes to, um, just how successful you've been with dirt bike tv so far is that you're so relatable you don't like kind of talk over top of people you don't go 100 feet over their head and make it make people feel like they're like they're stupid for not knowing like it's literally like um if if, if there's a if there's an instagram or, or a youtube way of someone taking somebody by the hand and walking them through a way to become a, a safer and more productive person in the in the garage you have certainly found a way to do that well, I appreciate it. That, and I guess that's kind of the goal was, you know, from where I grew up and not having a lot of help. So when I uh, saw a niche here, I, I wasn't a big fan of social uh, to, other than it would help some of the companies I work with. Some of right. those companies 
promote their brands to in addition to the builds I do, I thought, okay, it'd be a good way for us to promote those builds and so forth, in addition to the stories and promote the magazine stories and the YouTube videos on these builds. And then I started noticing a, a, this little niche of areas. We take it for granted, especially living in California, and I'm around all the race teams and engine builders. And you mentioned Race Tech at the beginning. That's a company. I, I'm in there almost once a week, uh, picking up something and visiting with the Andrew in the race shop or, yes. or uh, uh, Wyatt doing, doing our suspension. And uh, we have a couple sets in there right now to pick up. So I'm always running around going by Twisted and KTM and all these shops. And so what happens is over those 30 years, you just learn a lot just by looking over the shoulder technique. Uh, you know, yep. and paying attention to what other people are doing. So a lot of, uh, I didn't go to any uh, special mechanic school or anything, but a lot of what I've learned over the years has just been paying attention to what other guys do and then learning stuff also from trial and error as well. So when you're working on a lot of bikes, anywhere from most years, 20 to 30 bikes we have throughout the shop as far as projects in various ways, so it's a little bit long-term. So we see a lot of different bikes. And so we've learned a lot. And so when I started find this little niche, you know, something that's real basic. A lot of my buddies like in California will, will make fun of a little tutorial we do, something that's very simple. And they're like, oh yeah, that's so basic. But somebody who maybe is in Nebraska or somewhere and isolated doesn't have a, a group of uh, mechanics around him. He's like, this is awesome, you know? And that goes throughout the oh, world absolutely. as well. Yeah, so that, that's that been a big part of it is that not everyone has a big circle of good mechanic buddies, uncles, whatever around them. To, to learn this stuff from. So that, I guess that's, and that's what's hard for when you're out in the industry in California, everybody thinks, well, everybody knows that and not everybody does, you know. Oh, for sure. Uh, it's very easy to sort of get lost in the bubble uh, of sort of just like that. That's the community you're around. So that, that, that's, that's my world. That's what uh, all, the whole world does know. Uh, and that's not the case. Um, you certainly are a, uh, a valedictorian graduate of the, uh, the, the motocross university. And it's kind of funny how it is where like um, you having so many of those people around, like whether you work with or, or people that you go um, like you work with on, on, a, on a sponsorship level is say you're like working on something in the garage and you do something how you've always done it. And, so, and someone who either like they have a kind of a trick of the trade or uh, they do it differently. Like, why are you doing it that way? Like, this is so much simpler. And that's sort of like bit by bit, piece by piece. How do you sort of like pick up those little um, like tidbits over the years? Like, and <clears throat> I've even learned over the years, like I'll, I'll always drop in on my buddy, uh, uh, Brian Fleck or, uh, um, Marshall over at uh, Dunlop when I go uh, pick up uh, like well, I've, I've like, I'll be honest I've dropped off a set of rims just to get some uh, some tires on there to Supercross it's happened uh, but uh, like that guy can flip over a tire and uh, well actually the two of you I'd like to see the two of you guys square off but um, just want, like he could he could be looking you dead in the eye and and uh, and, and change a tire in a matter of minutes um, and and I, I'd watch him do his thing and I'm like like literally just standing there pick up like five things i'm like okay i don't do that uh, that's a really good tip and those are the things that yeah you can share with people and all of a sudden like they take that they put it in their back pocket and then they take it to the track they see somebody else that's like in a frantic panic to try and flip a tire uh between motos all of a sudden they're able to jump in and share the knowledge that you shared with them and they're like hey how'd you learn how to do that i learned it from jay clark go watch dirt bike tv <laughs> and that's what it's all about right <laughs> Yeah, that, that's been fun part of it. And as you mentioned, Brian's the one that taught me how to do tires, kind of the Dunlop that's awesome. way. So we, we, yeah, so when I got on with Dunlop, I said, I want to do tires the same way. So when I go to a shootout and I'm doing tires, I'm doing it the same way. And I learned it. And I wasn't great at doing tires, you know, to over 20 years ago. But the, once, you know, in the last 20 years, I've gotten really proficient at it. But I will say, I still go out with Brian. Uh, I'll help him before the Nationals or Supercrosses. Like, we'll go by KTM uh, Pro Circuit. We'll go by Kawasaki and get a lot of the tires fitted up before the national start or whatever it is. And, and Brian is he got way more experience and way, way more uh, just ability doing tires. And he can do mooses like in two minutes, you know, he's, he's really, know. really good. So those guys do a lot of tires, the whole pro truck crew with Marshall and everybody on there does a great job. And that's, so that's really cool to be associated with a group like Dunlop. Uh, and, and unfortunately it can appear from social media that I'm do more or better than those guys, but by, by no means am I, those, those guys are, are amazing and do a great job with it. So they just don't have, they should have a social guy there videoing the, you know, a few of those tire changes every weekend. Uh, Cause that would be cool because they do a great job and it's, and the tire change thing is a big part of our shtick, so to speak. And uh, tire stands, as tire stands I use 
that's been a huge thing where I send out, I, like I, I posted one this morning from a kid and um, a guy in Germany. And then there was a kid in the UK the day before that. And it's throughout the world. And it's, it's really neat that everybody, get, they email us and get the drawings for those tire stands. And then they usually send us photos uh, of the t finished one and their bikes and stuff. So it's really been cool to see that throughout the whole country, a lot in Canada and throughout the U.S. and then all these other countries. It's really neat. Certainly. And that's maybe the most commonality between everyone who uh, enjoys two wheel exhilaration, throttle therapy, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, you might be a two stroke guy, you might be a four stroke guy, you might be a Yamaha, Honda, KTM, whatever, all the Austrian brands, but they all have tires. And we all struggle and have bloody knuckles switching them off uh, as, as frequently as we do. Um, like, I'm sure you've gotten some great feedback from people from people who are like, yeah, I used to like not like like literally either take my tire like my dad is one of these people. He will take his tire to a dealership to get them to flip it for him, and I just like this is like the walk of shame to go do that. Um, and then like from now, and then you've transformed those people into people who like yeah, flip a tire. I'm Jay Clark. Watch this, and uh, that's that's got to be pretty cool to be able to give back to the community like that. And I think that's a lot of our thing is that they see a guy like me, you said, who's a real advice guy, like a real guy. If they go, hey, a guy like that can do it, I, I can do it, you know. And, and then I think it gives guys confidence too. So like like you said, if I try to speak real world to them and uh, I just encourage, hey, take in your time and, and do those as you tear something and videos as you tear a bike down, for instance, those types of things, just some advice like that, that. Hey, you know, a lot of guys can do this. Now, if you don't feel comfortable, maybe splitting an engine apart, maybe set that aside, have somebody help you do that. And you guys can do the rest with this. And you find the things that you can uh, do on your own. So that's really cool to be able to help people. I think one of the big comments, like you're saying, Certainly. And yeah, like, I think it's, it's kind of baby steps, right? Like you learn how to do small stuff. Like that's how I sort of started working on bikes. My dad's not extremely mechanically inclined. Uh, so sometimes he struggles with stuff and it, like, honestly, he wouldn't even teach me how to do stuff because he straight up didn't know. Um, and uh, like you, you start off with like changing, changing tires or, or changing your chain, doing sprockets and stuff like that. And you f slowly, but surely build the confidence to want to like take more things apart and, and learn. And actually, it was really funny back in the day when uh, I like, I had a, a KX 250F that I like my throttle was sticking in it. Like it was kind of like gritty and stuff in the, the throttle housing. And I'm like, you know what? I'm taking this thing apart. I'm going to, I'm going to figure out how this thing works. And this was back when like, they kind of has like, a, like has like a push pull, like there's two, two cables in there. And I had the thing apart and my dad's looking at me like, how yeah. the hell are you going to get that back thing, thing back together? And I was like, don't worry. I like took mental pictures as we, we, we sort of put this thing apart and he was blown away that I was able to get the thing uh, back going again. But um it's those little pieces that sort of build the confidence and that's a, that's a to allow you to what's sorry and, and that's a safety sorry? issue right there that you yeah. helped solve something that could have been a safety concern like that those types of fixing and maintaining those types of things are critical to your safety uh, because if that thing is stuck when you're riding it, it could cause you know to crash and i've been a victim of that so you learn things that are really important to address and like a sticky throttle cable would be one of those that's a very important yeah, absolutely. No, that that is uh, like like just having a bike that you know is running at top. Like when when you know the the like the bike is running at top condition, you're able to be just that much more comfortable on the bike. If you know damn well that you're like oh, I haven't had I haven't done my suspension in a while, uh, my brakes are probably like far too worn, and this back tire is not going to be able to hook up the way I want it to. Uh, those are just like that. If it takes like little one percentage points away from your confidence on the bike, those can add up to just not a lot of comfort on the bike whatsoever. And when you're not comfortable, you're not going to be confident. If you're not comfortable, confident, honestly, you're not going to be safe. Uh, so you're, you're helping people out on that side as well. Um, tell me about some of these race winning brands that you work with. See what I did there. Oh, nice. Yeah. So I work with uh, that race winning brands group is recluse as you see on the shirt there and Wisco pro X J E. Um, a lot of really good companies and they have, they have a few that are kind of outside our regular uh, power sports that we deal with that are more street oriented, but th those brands uh, are really nice to work with. And then, uh, so, so that's been like kind of the core because most of the stuff we do is a lot of engine stuff. So that'll take care of a lot of that. Then I've worked with companies uh, for a long time, such as FMF and Dunlop to help finish that. And then I have smaller companies that I work with, but those are the, the core companies that I work with that are really helpful. And if you, if guys ever want to see or know what we do, 
our website, Dirt Bike TV One, uh, has a list of those companies and all that kind of stuff. Certainly, yeah, it's it's actually a really cool website and uh, and very detailed. So uh, hats off to either yourself or whoever uh, designed the website. There's a gr- a lot of great information there. Um, tell me a little bit about working with Motion Pro. Um, like I've always thought to myself that the motocross industry, the teams, a lot of magazines don't don't do nearly enough. Uh, like sort of, I wouldn't say coverage, but they they don't um like plug the the tools of the trade that as much as they probably should because as much as people like spend their time on their bikes like honestly in a, in a given week i'm probably working on my bike probably equal amount of hours of actually being sitting on the seat um working with a, a company like motion pro that has so many like they have like just the 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 t handles and the, the wrenches and that all that stuff that's awesome too but like they have a ton of little bits and bobs that make that just make the make your life so much easier in the in the garage whether it's uh stuff for changing tires their tire gauges uh even their their tire spoons and stuff like that and of course you use their tire stands so uh yeah tell me a little bit working with those guys yeah it, it is really cool as you say because they, they're a company that specializes in building specific motorcycle tools. So now can you get by with, uh, uh, without some of them? Some of them you can get by without, and some of the OEMs will have special tools for, for pulling, say, a flywheel, different things. But Motion Pro has been pretty smart about making specific parts, uh, tools that are helpful for working on dirt bikes. And you you can use the right tool for the job. And so I get a lot of comments. Guys will ask me about, um, you know, can you show us changing a tire on the ground or this or that? And it's like, well, no, I want to do it the right way. So I try to, but I also try to be cognizant that not everyone can afford to have the, the best, uh, you know, bike or the best tools. It, it, I understand that not everyone has that ability. So I try to give them an option, you know, B or C, but with uh, motion pro that's option a, you know, you can get all the, all the proper tools and it's nice. Like uh, my buddy, Brad does a lot of our engine rebuilds. And we, we've gotten him set up with most all the critical tools, every puller that we need and holder. Uh, and it, it's, it's just able, it's just so much nicer. We got him a cool tool the other day to pull the counter shaft and other types of sprock, uh, seals. But the counter shaft seal, you can pull it up without having to pry it with a screwdriver. It's actually a puller for that seal. That's really cool. So you, 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 you and the, the benefit of that is you ri- you're not as apt to be able to maybe scratch the case right there where you might pry it out with a screwdriver or a prior tool. So just little things they've thought of that they that are just really cool tools. Now, you, do you have to have everyone? No. You know, I'm going to say, hey, if you're on a budget, you don't have to. I always say you don't have to have it. You can make do. But it's nice to have that A-level stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Anything that kind of makes things easier. Uh, like there are other methods out there. But uh, given the fact that there's a company out there who's uh, willing to put in the research and development into solving these problems or uh, or, or providing solutions to like, I'm sure there's 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 engineers out there all the time that's like ah, I can I can do this with a screwdriver scratches the shit out of my cases there's got to be a better way uh, and that's literally what what engineers do they see problems and they uh, they 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 use their brains to to figure it out um, but on top of like all the all the garage stuff and you do an amazing job with that you also ride your dirt bike a ton and that's one of the things that i love about uh following along with with everything that you're doing you you're able to share that with your son as well uh you guys are kind of a dynamic duo that way um like venture to guess how much time you spend on a dirt bike uh, throughout a calendar year it's, it's up but i try to ride at least twice a week and then when it's rainy season in the winter time in california that can be as much as four or five days in a week and and it and what and I have the ability from work, working from home that I'm able to then then end up working yeah. late into the night to catch up on emails and work at real work and uh, and then just washing bikes and maintaining bikes from that day of riding to the next day is a lot of work. Uh, we we maintain our bikes really well, so we don't usually come home and leave dirty bikes for the next day because it's not just about having a dirty bike, but you know that when you're letting the dirt sit there, it's staining. You're also when you're washing a bike, you're prepping it. You're also looking for anything that's loose. Uh, now you might need to do a filter oil change. You're not doing a filter and oil change on a dirty bike typically or adjusting the chain. You know, those types of things are all nice to do on a clean bike. Um, and so that was, and when you're, when we wash, we have videos that could tell you, that give you some good tips on washing. We wash a bike, we lay it down on both sides. We're really getting after it and really cleaning it. We blow it off really well. So it's a whole process. It's not just washing the bike, but we call it prepping the bike. So as you wash, you're prepping for the next ride. So everything's getting, you know, looked at and lubed and blow, blow it off. So we're not getting water into those bearing surfaces, just little things that we've learned that, that really help. And then, as, and I think the riding thing, even though I'm 53, I'm turning 54 uh, in two days. And uh, the, 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 I think what helps it to be a, 
you know, a good person that gives exciting information, I think, to people is that I am a true enthusiast. I think if I didn't ride or have that passion about riding, I wouldn't be nearly as excited about, you know, showing people stuff and doing stuff. I, I'm able to still stay active doing it and uh, try to avoid injuries as much as possible. So I'm in a, I'm in the midst, in between a little bit of an injury right now, but hopefully I'll be riding here pretty, pretty quick. Fair enough. Well, yeah, hopefully you heal up quick and happy early birthday on that. Uh, that is, that is awesome. Yeah. No, I, I love that you're, you're an enthusiast, you're a practitioner and, um, and, and you, you, you turn literally everything into content. Um, it's pretty interesting to see, like you said, you're turning 50, 53, 54, 54, you're about to be 54 years old. Um, like social media, like it, there's, there's like some people will tell you that it's a, it's a young man's game or like you, you have to be super young to be on there or understand the algorithms and stuff like that. Um, and what I love is that you just cut straight through that, it, like the, like all of the like, sort of stereotypes of what you think would like be like, what, when makes someone successful, or if, if there's an age limit, there is no age limit, uh, when it comes to social media, what you have to be is consistent and genuine. And you are both of those things in absolute spades. And I think that is the absolute linch linchpin to your success. And I think in a lot of ways, like just because of your work ethic and your enjoyment of it, you basically do that completely by accident. Or I'm sure it's kind of on purpose because you realize that like the consistency of it really does work. But the reality is if you just keep making content, if you just keep like adding value and bringing stuff, so eventually the people who find you, like you're gonna have like a huge catalog for them to rip through. So like you might have done like a hundred videos before anybody really noticed, but when they noticed they had a hundred videos to go through and um, that like the, your stick to and your ability to just like, you know, what? I'm going to make this content. I'm going to keep doing it. And uh, yeah, age is just a number. I'm, I'm enjoying my thing. Um, like at some point, I'm sure there was some imposter syndrome that had probably kind of like come in a little bit. Cause you're just like, Hey, like, what am I doing here? Cause I'm like, I'm on like, TikTok or Instagram or whatever it is. Uh, but you were able to get through that, man. I, I give you hats off because uh, not a lot of people do that. Well, I appreciate it. And that's what that's what I wanted to do. If we were going to do social media, I wanted it to be somewhat genuine and not pretend to be someone I'm not. We, we play music from the 80s if, when there's music there. So it, we're not uh, trying to play something current. We don't show uh, girly stuff and we don't have any cussing going on or anything like that. And so we, and one of the big comments we got early was, because social media isn't a great place for, you know, dads to watch stuff with their kids, we would get comments from dads going, it's great that I can watch this with my kids. And so that, nice. that's been fun. That, 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 that's pretty neat thing that they actually have a moto place that they can watch with, with kids. And so I thought that was kind of cool. And that's kind of always been that way uh, for the most part. So that gives them a fun place to watch. And, and when we do post uh, our writing videos, maybe you know, obviously they're not as fast as the top pros or the off-road guys, but we try to put some fun content in there for guys to show that we we really enjoy it. Yeah, and like honestly, I think of it as it's content for the everyman because, like, I like just like yourself, there is a uh, maybe not as talented in the uh, on the social media side, but there's a Jay Clark in Pennsylvania. There's a there's a Jay Clark in Winnipeg, Manitoba. There's a Jay Clark in Alberta. There's a Jay Clark in Arizona. Like there, but and like everyone can relate to that and and just be able to sort of like put themselves in your shoes and be like, yeah, like look, like there he's enjoying the sport. I'm gonna get back into the sport. And I, I'll be honest, like my my dad watches all of your stuff. He he, I'm sure he's probably a better he's probably better at, uh, at uh, uh, spinning wrenches than he was back when he used to uh, prep my 80s for uh, for the races here in Manitoba. Um, but just seeing you do your thing, like that's motivated him to like, you know what, I'm gonna ride a dirt bike more next year. And I'm going to sign up for the for the world vets. So like, and he's just one example of very many people that I'm sure you do that for. Uh, so may, may, I think uh, Glenn Helen probably shouldn't be charging you every time you drive up there, which they probably did. No, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Glenn Helen's kind of our, our home. Glenn Helen's our home away from home. It's it, it's I like it's it. It's fun and it's neat, and it's fun that people from far away as Canada and stuff want to come to Glen Helen and ride the big track, and it's. It's been really neat to see that. And there's been a huge contingent of Canadians come down for those races. And, you know, Matt, Matt, this is a big part of that. To, I think getting his group to go with Kiefer and different people pushing yeah. that. But it's uh, fun to see. And I'm glad that I can help anybody get more into it. And I think, you know, I think life is is short, as we know. And it's nice to be able to enjoy those things that we can with other like-minded people riding dirt bikes. It's It makes it fun. And I, I guess what I think, one of the things that come, pops in my head that we're talking about those tire stands is, 
uh, re, re, a couple times I've had where I posted a, a tire stand and a bike guy from Ukraine and in Russia, like a day apart, you know, and it's like throughout the world, everybody just wants to ride dirt bikes. They don't care about politics and, and, and th these types of things. They just want to ride dirt bikes and they know what's fun. Yeah, absolutely. That is the the connective tissue that uh, keeps this community so lubricated. And uh, like, yeah, we're like we all we might be in different areas of the world. Believe it or not, there's people in in Russia, Ukraine, U.S., Canada, whoever, wherever else who listen to this podcast. Always blows me away when I look at the analytics of who watch, lose listening from where. I'm like, how is someone finding this podcast in South Korea? But they are, uh, and it it blows my mind. Um, but yeah, to be able to connect with people and do exactly that. And yeah, like for, if you bring, if you, you can motivate somebody from the flat, barren plain wasteland of, of Manitoba, which like you can watch your dog run away for three days only for it to come back because it's hungry. Uh, and for them to sign themselves up to go take on Mount St. Helen, uh, I would, you'd throw your shoulder out, putting, uh, get patting yourself on the back on that one, man. Uh, it's been, uh, quite the journey and, uh, by the sounds of it, nowhere near done. No, no, it's it it's still fun, and uh, I still need to be working, and it, it's I always say it's better than a real job. It's better than digging ditches, and so um, it, being able to work with a lot of the media uh, magazines and and now some of the other influencers and stuff is just really fun. I do work with some really good guys. I, you know, listen to your interview with Joel with Built Blind. Uh, yes, really good guy. You know, just a great story uh, that he's persevering and doing what he can. It's just amazing. You know, things like that. And I work with. A couple other remote builders, I'll call them Michael Fishers in Nebraska, good guy I work with on a few builds. So what we'll do is we'll do a little bit of things where we build a lot of the bike with, with there with him, and then we ship it out to California, finish it up at my place just to maybe put graphics on in tires and kind of finish it up and then get it shot. And that's been really fun to work with, you know, guys like that. Um, uh, just some, some good guys. I got uh, Now that Brent Griffiths in Las Vegas is another guy we just finished a bike with, we shot with Swap Moto. Uh, so, and so, but my first ones, I... So I have kind of these builds. I work with some of these other key guys, and then I, we have our own group of bikes we work with. And with my son, who helps a ton, he's in Utah, and he's finishing his bachelor's degree. Just He'll graduate just in a month. And so we'll see what, what awesome. holds up for the, for the future there. But we we try to ride. Uh, the winter time's a little tougher, but we try to ride a couple times a month in a good uh, time of the year. No kidding. Well, yeah, that, that, yeah, like uh, congratulations to your son. That is absolutely huge. Uh, and you've got to be one proud Papa in, in that respect. And, and just to be able to share this experience with him and, and, and build the following, um, and, and impact that many people, that must be a really cool thing you're able to share with him. Oh yeah. And he was the one that once it kind of started rolling a little bit, our first Instagram, we lost the account for it. We, you know, so it's still there. We, we lost all the sign-ins, my buddy, his, him and his kid made it for us. They made us this account, and then like six months later, I'm like, "Hey, what's that info?" You know, they they lost it. We couldn't find it because they made up an email address. So Spencer made another one, the a legit one. And once that thing started rolling, he goes, "I think this thing could really do well, you know, and take off, and, and it'd be good." And we don't ever have any ideas of making money on uh, social, but the idea is that it would help promote the, all the companies that I do work with in a way, and also those outlets that we work with with Swap Moto and Motocross Action, Dirt Bike, and Racer X vital all those companies we work with to promote them as well so it's been a good a fit for that and been fun to kind of grow that other part of it and then a lot of companies realize the value of a good social and that's been helpful because we do promote things together and you know i'll do a post for for dunlop and decal works and other good companies we work with Certainly. And one of the things that I think that you have uh, mastered is the fact that you're able to uh, weave in the product plugs and and sort of those product knowledge, those like mini product knowledge meetings. I, I love what you do with those. It's basically like you're telling somebody about a product, the features and benefits of it, and sort of in the, but at the same time, sort of not really tricking them, but like you're also, it's it's a little bit, of, it's a mini commercial that's sort of uh, dipped in there from probably doesn't even notice. Uh, but at the same time, you're adding value with showing them how it works or uh, how, it, how to install it. So uh, like, there's there's info coming with the product knowledge. And uh, yeah, that's like that's marketing 101. If you can show somebody like the features and benefits of how this product is going to benefit their lives and how they can uh, make use of it on top of like bringing a new product to their awareness, uh, that is an intersection that uh, really helps a lot of people sort of like put that theater of the mind that, hey, I might be able to put this into practice for myself. And uh, that just moves product, man. And and that's what we're trying to do ultimately. But also, I, I want to be honest with people and 
I try and I and everybody always says this, but I I only want to show products that I feel like are really going to benefit them. And then we get a lot yeah. of we answer every every DM at least get some type of answer where it's hey email us because that's really they're all supposed to email us. And if they email us, I answer every email. Period. And some of that can be as simple. We have a Google Doc that goes in this re blanket response, and that Google Doc that Spencer's made up has just numbers of topics. Uh, and you can see it from our website if you go look in there. And it's got all these topics you can go find. You know, say your front end's out of whack after a crash, right? You want to tighten your steering stem. You want to straighten your bike. That's a common one. You can go find that. Uh, leading a clutch on a KTM, you can go look that up and you can watch these videos. And so that's been really helpful for people to be able to do. And, and Spencer's been able to help build this, this little, it's getting really big now, this Google Doc with all these different topics. And so that's been really helpful for people to be able to go and, and find it and help them along. Certainly. That's definitely helping people out. It's dirtbiketv1.com. And what's that email if they have a question for you? Uh, there's a couple, there's one on there. Jay at dirt bike TV one is the easiest one. J A Y at dirt bike TV one. They can email us okay. and we'll, and we try to, you know, if, if they got a technical question, if they describe it out really well, have some photos and maybe list everything they've done. My buddy, Brad helps me out a lot on some of the engine ones that I can't get. Um, I've got another buddy that does, it's more of a KTM specialist guy. We won't mention him because he, he's working at KTM. So uh, I got a couple <laughs> guys that help on different things, but, uh, I would say over half the questions I usually am able to answer straight away. And then if it's a lot of guys that are writing us, it's because they've been struggling, getting something to, you know, figure it out. And, uh, a lot of times it's, uh, you know, we have been able to help a lot of people. Some people we can't, you know, it's difficult helping somebody remotely, you know, so some, some things you're just going to have to get to a shop, but at least we can get them pointed in the right direction of what to try next. And if you don't have a big circle of a lot of times troubleshooting bikes can be actually that if you have another bike there that you're pulling parts off and on, if you get to a certain point, that's what you, with modern bikes now with four strokes and fuel injection, um, Sometimes one of the first things you do is you swap fuel tanks because the fuel tank is, you know, the fuel pump is and fuel filter is a common thing to go out. So that's an easy thing to swap first and try one from another bike. If you got a buddy that's got a bike in the same couple of years there that'll fit, you bolt it up and see if that solves your problem. You know, so we can help give people tips of what to do next. And so we have a lot of that kind of content for them. Certainly. And, and that must be a pretty rewarding experience if you're like possibly thousands of miles away from somebody and you're able to diagnose and uh, and and help them with their problem. I don't, I don't think that that feeling would get old, I'd imagine. No, not at all. And it, for, for my wife and daughter, they want to, uh, what's funny is when we help people in other countries, we have this huge list of all these cool countries that people have invited us to. They want us to go and ride with them. Oh my God. Yeah. And come stay with them. And I don't like to go anywhere. I don't like to fly anywhere. I only like to drive and <laughs> So it makes my wife all mad. She's like, her and Spencer and my daughter, they want to go to these countries that people are inviting us to go to Australia, New Zealand, and go all over to Europe and stuff and go visit these people in these remote uh, countries. Because we, we've gotten emails from people. My wife's counted as like over 40 countries right now or something like this. She's added up and looked at these places. So it's pretty neat uh, to be able to see that. So uh, I'm not much for wanting to, you know, take 12 hour flights anywhere. Yeah, Jay, Jay's just over here turning down uh, uh, beautiful weekends in a, a cabin in Finland somewhere with a sauna and a and a uh, like infinity pool or something along those lines. Ah, uh, that's amazing. But uh, what's what's next on the docket for you? What what is on the on the horizon? You've done a, a ton of amazing builds lately. Uh, my two near and dear to my heart uh, are uh, the couple of Wisco YZ250 and 125 builds. Those matching bikes. That's near and dear to my heart because as I grew up. Here in Canada, you needed to race both 125 and 250. You had to have matching bikes in order yes. to to compete for the Canadian National Championship uh, because it was on total points. You couldn't just race the 250 class, and or at that time it was the 450. Like it was the 250 class, but that's where 450s would run. Uh, thanks to uh, Doug Dubach right. for coming up here and waxing everybody. Uh, but uh, yeah, like uh, what, what's what's sort of on the on the docket for you, and what are some of your favorite builds? Well, so right now. Uh... I have an MXA YZ250, I got a 23 YZ250 two-stroke, and this one we actually did more he more modifications to with Tom Morgan Racing, yep. we modified it pretty heavily, and so we'll be shooting that one in the next week or so, um, and I just shot a YZ250F that's really good with Twisted as a dual injector, and a lot of people saw on our uh, Instagram, we had some videos of this dual injector, I had the air, filters, air filter off, and you actually see the dual injector just squirting right into the motor, People just That's love cool. it. So that bike's been really good with dirt bike we just shot. And then um, finishing up uh, another little 85 for dirt bike magazine. 
Uh, I had a Swap Moto 250, what KTM 250F we're finishing up, and then I got a KTM 350 XCF that I'm building. And that's what, what Race Tech has a suspension for that one as well as that Swap Moto that they're finishing. We're putting spring forks on those, uh, kind okay. of a, more of a fan of sp spring forks. Uh, but those the 23 KTM 350 is one of my favorite. But all the 350 XCFs, you know, like 17 and up, are just my favorite all around bike. If a guy can only have one bike. Um, and that's not a bad thing I'm because I have the luxury of having multiple bikes. But if you have only one bike and you want to be able to ride track and trail, that 350 XCF is one of the best bikes to do that because it's great. It feels at home on the track and then on the trail, it's just amazing. So to me, that's one of the best bikes, all around bikes that I enjoy. And I actually just bought a 23. I got a used one because uh, they are so expensive, but I got a good deal. Nice. On a four hour, four hour bike. So and then I've already put more damage on it than it had when I got it. No, oh, yeah. Well, you you put a lot of seat time in, man. Honestly, I think throughout the year you probably you probably ride about three or four times as much as I get to, given the fact that it is snowing right now. Uh, but that is that's uh, my, my damn my fault for uh, for calling this place home up here in Canada. But uh, uh, man, this has been so much fun to sort of pick your brain on some stuff. Like uh, like I said, I, I knew we were gonna not not even be able to really scratch the surface uh, of all things Jay Clark, which is which is why we're gonna have to to call you up again at some point uh down the road but uh yeah this has been so much fun i hope that people if you're not already following jay on instagram or youtube uh at dirt bike one all right at dirt bike tv one is uh the the one-stop shop for for everybody to uh just become more acclimated to um being more useful and more productive in the in the garage and honestly if like i i don't think that jason wygant listened to this, po this podcast but he better be subscribed both both i like youtube and uh and instagram because if if any of the stories of him working on dirt bikes is true um yeah he, like he should be spending every waking hour uh at least taking some notes watching your videos because uh yeah the stories are horrendous and he is and, right and i've met him in person but the the, the jokes are yeah. that he's also cheap so i think that would be beneficial because if i try to do give some good tips for if you're cheap as yeah. well so that'd be a good place for him to help him out on both avenues no doubt. Well, uh, thank you so much for making the time for me today, man. This has been so much fun. Uh, like I said, we're going to have to have you on again sometime soon. But uh, yeah, it sounds like you, you got some more driving to do this e this afternoon. And uh, yeah, hopefully uh, whatever your injury you're dealing with, uh, you heal up quick, enjoy your birthday, and uh, yeah, get back on two wheels soon. Hey, thanks, man. It's been a great time and good luck with everything you got going. And are you going to come down in November for the race with your dad? Yes, I will be there. It is my 35th birthday. They always have it literally right on uh, November 6th is my birthday. So it's usually right in around that. And uh, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to coming down. Uh, I'm fingers crossed that I can get I, what I'm what I really want to do is be able to get together a, a four stroke for my dad uh, to be able to race because like we, he, he has a 252 stroke a Cowie that just jumps out of his hands. Uh, so, uh, at 65 years old, I don't know that that's the best bike for him to be, uh, going up Mount St. Helen on. Uh, so we're going to work on that, but actually just before I let you go, um, you being so connected with, uh, Glenn Helen, you must have, uh, some stories about Tom White. Like, uh, oh, yeah. a guy who was near and dear to my heart, a guy who, at, I was 28 at the time. Like there, 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 there was no reason for Tom to take two hours out of his day to walk just me around his entire early years of motorcycle uh, museum. It was a Wednesday. He put a mountain bike ride on hold for me. And literally like we just walked by every single bike, whether it was the Greaves, the, the, the 1974, um, rm or m 400 and the the his like the the harley davidson's he has the the motocross harley davidson's he has um that was a very special man and uh, i'm sure you have some special things to say about him oh for sure and you you, I, you didn't even prime me for that but he was one of the first uh shops i went when i worked for weisco in like in 93 i would 93 94 i would go all through there the late nineties, I would go into white brothers quite often and I would do little sales seminars with the uh, sales staff on for Wisco and be up there and I'd That's be all cool. nervous and just, you know, didn't know, you know, how to handle myself and, and, you know, say these things. And, but I built really good relationships with all the salesmen there and the guys there and with Tom himself and, and Tom, it, you know, he was always like that. And, um, 
so anyway, that was, and, and it's, it, it was a tough, uh, tough loss, obviously for a community. And uh, we help out with Ventco is our, uh, uh, my, my good buddy, Kurt Leverton, uh, it's his company. And so once a week, we try to post a Tom White uh, written article on one of those bikes. There's a quite an yeah. archive of them. So we try to post one once a week on Thursdays or so. So that's been really fun to kind of keep that memory alive. He wrote a lot of really good articles about a lot of those bikes, the history of them and why they were cool. Because some of the bikes you would just go, oh, that looks cool, but you wouldn't know why it was cool. And he 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 obviously yeah. knew all the why as to why it was cool. So and he and he just was a genuine guy like that. And he rode all the way up until he probably shouldn't have been riding. He would, you know, he would yeah, he was sick. The he last sick. month he was alive, he rode. And so he was sick, got better, then he would be out riding. And um I think for all of us, that's our happy place. And and he had a lot of life loss in his life and some trials. And so for him to be able to enjoy that last bit has been uh, was I'm sure really good for him. And then W is kept alive with his daughter, Kristen and John Anderson. It keeps W alive and a little bit of that memory alive. And it's unfortunate that White Brothers, the name went away with the company that bought it and didn't take care of it real well, you know, because it, it was a great place. Yeah. It was it was the technical distributor. They were the only distributor that would actually have guys that knew dirt bikes on the phone that really could help you with a carburetor setting or uh, what pipes are going to be best and building wheels and build, you know, just custom stuff, you know, and that people that distributors don't have now. Yeah. They, they were certainly part of sort of like a bygone era where there was a real personal touch that existed with that, with that, like the actual over the phone operators who'd be able to help you out and have people on hand. It's just sort of like a, something that I don't know, I'm sure it sort of still makes sense to have that in, in 2023, but with, just the the age of technology the, the certain things like that have just gone away and uh i just think of like the integrity that uh, a guy like tom had and and just the the time he 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 made time to uh meet with i like the it was the the first time me and my dad went down just to go watch uh the world vets uh my dad took time or uh, tom took time out of his day to meet my dad and and introduce my dad to his hero jody weitzel uh which which is like my dad doesn't go a month without reading a jody's box that is like that is three guarantees death taxes in jody's box when it comes to my old man uh so that was a huge thrill and uh for for tom to be able to pull some strings and make that happen it was uh was a huge thing for him so um yeah it just again speaks volumes to just how how important that guy was a very special person well he's he's the reason there is that race that you're going to go to in yeah. november uh he he was the the driving force behind that and uh brought up infancy and he had the four stroke nationals before that and then the four stroke nationals eventually wore out their uh, need needfulness because every everybody was on four strokes. So then yeah. they rolled it into a two two stroke national in, in the spring in the in the uh, in the spring, which we're going to have in a couple weeks. Which will be yeah, out exactly. There. Yeah, so we'll be out there in a couple weeks, and we'll have some displays at the Wisco booth. And uh, I probably won't be racing that weekend, but hopefully the week or two after that, I'll be uh, out there. But I'll be out there for that race, and that's kind of a, a really fun time. Uh, people love two stroke content. Uh, there, there's no doubt about it. So always, I, yeah. So we'll be out there and uh, recording some and getting the sights and smells of the two stroke uh, national. Yeah, you could build up the most badass two stroke or four four stroke tip to tail, all the bells and whistles. But if you roll out a two stroke with a nice uh, works pipe on there and some clean graphics, I'm sorry, best in show. <laughs> like, <laughs> right. That's exactly people come right. over like uh, i know don don from swap one was telling me that he's like yeah you could you could literally like just have a nice looking two stroke and uh you'll turn more heads with that which uh i'm the proud owner of more than a few of those but um jay this has been so much fun like i said we could go on for hours but i know you got to get yourself going uh thank you so much for making time for the big mx radio podcast hey thank you had a great time and uh, we'll we'll get together and i'll look forward to uh, meeting you in person in november Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I will, I will be in Vegas for the, uh, for world mini, unfortunately on the same weekend as the, uh, as that two stroke race. Uh, so only about three hours away from where you're at. So uh, maybe me and the verb boys drive down to ha have a beer with you sometime. Uh, but uh, yeah, looking forward to it. We'll see, we'll see you in November. All right. Thank you. We'll see you soon. Awesome, man. Do not hang up just yet, but for podcast sake, we're going to cut it off right there.